Welcome, Rachel, to the World XP Podcast. This is episode number 23. And for those of you who remember episode four with Pablo, uh, it was from PR Performance Fitness. This is the R in PR Performance Fitness. And uh, it's been a while, been a long time coming, I think, to have you on. So welcome. Thank you. Yes, it has been a long time, Eric. Um, I remember episode four. Uh, that was when we could see people in person. Uh, yeah, kind of. We were in this apartment, actually, before we moved in. So it was just an empty apartment. We used, like, <laughs> two kitchen chairs and, like, a fold-up table with a tablecloth. And yeah, it was and, a simple setup, for yeah, sure. Yeah, and you and Dylan were, like, sitting in the corner. Yeah, that was... Um, <laughs> Hopefully we'll have more sophisticated setup in, in the future when we now can you, go back in person, but. Now you have a new mic, so we can explore I that. I mean, you're getting fancy now. I know, so fancy. You got the new mic. You guys would have seen this on my uh, on the Instagram story. Got it on sale from Amazon. I don't even remember. It took me three months to open the box, to be honest, because we were working on uh, stacking some more episodes for release, but. With that said, it's all good. Things happen yeah, well, when you move. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Um, I really like podcasts and got into them this year. So that's sort of why I invited myself onto your show. <laughs> um, because I didn't, I've never listened to them mm -hmm. and or audiobooks. And I tried audiobooks like a couple of times in the past maybe six, seven years. And mm -hmm. I tried them while working out. I tried them while walking and I like hated them. But then I started podcasts because a client gave me access to their Spotify premium. Um, yes, which I love. And I like the conversation part. So mm -hmm. it's really stimulating to me and way more interesting to hear dialogue than just a monologue of someone sharing their their work so yeah 100 percent. this podcast is something well i started listening probably a couple of years ago like in the car on the way to work because i was driving from basically making the 95 commute and that okay. was horrid absolutely horrid uh pre-covid obviously and sometimes well you don't want to be looking at your phone while driving so changing the song can be difficult so i started podcasts which were like <laughs> Uh, an hour or two long, which was needed for that commute. Um, specifically, Rogan. Uh, well, I found Rogan because who was on it? Yeah, you told me you liked him. Yeah, I don't remember who was on it. Uh, Jordan Peterson, I think it was. He's a psychologist. Um, and Jenna obviously is in, she's getting her master's in psychology. So she like put me on to him and I found that one. And then I was like, oh, this is interesting, and kind of went from there, a couple other guests, and then when COVID happened, um, I had more free time because I wasn't doing the commute anymore, so we were kind of like, screw it, why not? So here we are. It's been, That's it's been how big weird... things happen, yeah. that, that philosophy right there. <laughs> Pretty much, and we were just talking before, even with the soccer, like, in my own situation, that's kind of how I am. It's like starting to get opportunities just because I was like, screw it, why not like put myself out there and see what happens. So it's a weird, it's a weird thing, man. Like life, life can turn you on in different ways, just like different opportunities. You get lucky here and there and you never know. Did you, yeah. that was how you got lucky me and Pablo, didn't you? Or was that, or did you guys kind of seek yeah. each other out? So well, just me getting into personal training was was luck. My, I got out of college and definitely did that. Oh, sh now I have to work. Um, and I didn't really have a, a job that I wanted. I definitely went all over the map. I first thought I was going to get into government work because that's what my parents did, but I didn't really want to. I was just like, oh, $55,000. Like, that's good, right? Yeah. And um, then I was gonna try to become a, an agent, like a special agent. And uh, then, uh, what was it called? A, an analyst, uh, intelligence analyst. Mm -hmm. And I took- I, I went test. down that path as well. Oh my God, that test was so hard. 
they had like a it was like a three maybe maybe it was longer i don't remember because i couldn't answer any of the questions correctly um but it was like if x plus triangle equals pizza then obviously orange plus flower equals laptop oh of course it was laptop like how did i not <laughs> the logic? um so that's when i knew that that wasn't for me and my brother said hey there's this gym um opening up down the road why don't you apply to be a front desk or work they're you know redoing the gym they're hiring and i said mm -hmm. okay and so i applied to be a front desk person met with the owners they interviewed me they saw that i played basketball and that I've run like track and played all these different sports and I liked weightlifting. I said, why don't you learn to become a trainer? We need female trainers. And so I said, well, I don't, I graduated with a degree in biology and uh, I, I took on like a boot camp sort of job and I was coaching high school basketball. So I was in the fitness world, but they said they would help me out and mm -hmm. finding the right certification. And so I did that and that's where I met Pablo um, for the first time. He came on a couple of months after I had started and we're both the crazy people that works the 5 a.m. shift. Mm -hmm. And so when you meet someone at 5 a.m., it's, it's really different. You have stuff in your eyes, you haven't eaten. Um, so it was then that I knew that we could run a business together <laughs> because yeah. we take the 5 a.m. shift um but no that that's where we met and um when we didn't have clients we got to talk a little bit so he told me some of his life story which as you know is um quite colorful and that's for sure and you can find that on episode four that's right shameless, shameless good luck <laughs> um so yeah, it was it was funny because at first I was so shy at not being, well, I guess I wasn't shy. It was more like insecure about my job as a, a trainer mm -hmm. because I didn't know what I was doing. And I felt like all the other trainers knew what they were doing and especially um, him. And we had some like big dudes that have been lifting for a long time. So they just knew a lot more about lifting than than I did so I was like very kept to myself so he'll tell you uh that we weren't friends or I mm -hmm. didn't talk to him for at least a year and, <laughs> and then finally we started doing uh outdoor boot camps together mm -hmm. and uh then he realized that I was a human and I could speak and um that we had similar interest in the way we like to train and all that good stuff for those listening who don't know what a boot camp is, do you care to sort of describe that? Hmm. Uh, boot camp is a blanket term for an exercise class that can be run both indoor, outdoor. We run them at PR Performance Fitness. <laughs> See that shameless plug? <laughs> um, you and have a shameless you plug. Your, your Zoom name is PR Performance Fitness. Your well, plug, I did that on the whole episode. Yeah, I forgot to wear a nice like name tag and uniform shirt. So at least my my Zoom account represents, <laughs> which you can find that at www.pierreperformancefitness.com. Link um, in the description. Yeah, thank you. Swipe up, down, something. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's an exercise class that you can run indoor, outdoor. It usually involves like a lot less equipment mm -hmm. and uh, calisthenics. Uh, you can do running, jumping, uh, push-ups. They're known for burpees. People hate burpees. Those um, are the worst. Yeah, you usually get at least, at least eight of those at boot camps nowadays. At least eight. And then depending on if the instructor ate breakfast or not, you might get upwards of 30. Oof. And that's Jeez. The so I've seen, obviously you guys have for, advertised for some, I've seen advertisements for others. Are they just sort of like, what sorts of, like, I've never considered doing it, but what sorts of like, what purpose would it have from like, what sort of people look to sign up for, for those? So a uh, boot camp. 
Again, I, I ran those before I did personal training mm -hmm. and I solely did that is a great option for people to fit in a interesting and effective total body calorie burning workout. It's affordable. So usually they're like 10, $15 a class mm -hmm. and you get to meet people in them. It's high energy. So it's a lot easier to put yourself through uh, class than it is to go on the treadmill and, and run for an hour. Some people are not meant for that. And they like the interaction. Instructors tend to vary the exercises. They make you do partner work. And again, it's just high energy. If it's indoor, they usually have music pretty loud too. And um, yeah, I, I like group classes. Um, I like offering them as a, as a trainer. I don't know that I ever took them because I did a lot of specific training for, for basketball. And so it's, it's very generalized, but um, as a trainer, they're really fun because you get to, again, have people interact and they look at exercise differently when you do it in a class. And a lot of people have this view of exercise as almost something punishing sometimes. Well, I have to run, um, again, X amount of miles. I need to burn 600 calories because I ate a sandwich. Uh, whatever the logic is, it can get very, you know, kind of depressing. But if you're like, oh, I get to go to exercise class. I get to see Belly. She's crazy. And then, you know, my <laughs> friend Eric, he's there. He's awesome. He always pushes me. Now you have something you look forward to. It's a big stress relief. Um, and that's, that's why it can be really fun and easy to stay motivated. I have two, well, two kind of branch off things, but the first real quick, have you guys been in, like virtually, I, I would assume you don't get the same sort of like interaction, human thing, but is it still fun to run it virtually or is it kind of just like? It's meh? interesting. It's really interesting. I don't know what, I mean, we, we have started our virtual classes and one-on-one -on -one training since I guess maybe April is when we started it of 2020. And we never have done that before. So that was like brand new to our business. And so our trainers and myself, I was intimidated by it when we mm -hmm. first started because I'd never done it. And, um, you know, I remember my client saying, okay, are you ready? Like, let's start. Da -da -da. I was like, no, do we have to? Like, can we do outside? Um, because I wasn't sure how it was gonna work, but mm -hmm. it's kind of like this podcast, you know, it is different but you can get a lot out of it. You just have to set, you know, kind of parameters and like your, your goal for it. Like my goal for this podcast is to share my story to uh, kind of give some insight as to what my life has been like. I can do that, whether that's in person or online. The same for a training session and for a class, my goal is to motivate people to find passion and exercise and keep it a part of their daily life. So I may change how I have to do that um, by using people's names and making sure that I'm checking in on the screen where I don't leave people being just anonymous because what we pride ourselves in doing at PR Performance Fitness um, is the connection with our community. And I don't think our our online community would be successful if we didn't have in-person first. Like we are not the business that can get people from Arizona and California because of our online presence. No, these people are people that we have poured into in person and we have that connection. Certainly there were some people that came, came from it, but they came mm -hmm. from a referral. And so uh, I think it's possible and our trainers have done a really good job of trying to make that work. And so far I've seen most of our clients that have tried it, notice that, hey, this is actually a pretty good option for me. Mm -hmm. And I feel great um, once yeah. you find, you know, again, your equipment that you need, a camera setup and angle, you can get a lot out of uh, Zoom sessions or online sessions. Definitely, I took, when Kevin was running back in like March, April, like 
when everyone was first like, all right, stay at home. I was trying to figure out different things to do to stay in shape. Um, <laughs> Kevin was really funny because we had like that, like that group of um, older high school, like younger college guys that he would train. And when they wouldn't like, they would stop doing the push-ups or stop. He would yell at them. He's like, "Hey!" <laughs> exactly. No, and uh, that's the same. I was taking uh, Belly's class one time, and again, if you don't know Belly, she is crazy. She <laughs> is um, extremely energetic, and it doesn't matter if you are in person or online. She will find you. She will yell at you, and it's it's great. Um, my 100%. dad has to hide behind like the camera if he's not like doing the squats right <laughs> he doesn't want to get called out um but it's good I mean you know that's that's it's not for everybody but um again you kind of have to think about your goal of the session first mm -hmm. and if you keep that in mind you just may have to alter how you go about doing it to reach to people to connect to them to keep them again motivated which is really our number one goal with our clients yeah um when you're training like you mentioned like some people aren't meant to like run on a treadmill i feel as though i'm what like i hate running on treadmills and i refuse to like i'll do it but if there's a track like for example last week i was at the gym and i was like, i biked for a while because our game got canceled because of the because of the ice and so i like was on the station i biked for like an hour and i was like oh i should run on the treadmill and i got like a mile in and i was like <laughs> i don't want to do this and then by the same token, I can go to the track and crank out like two, three, four miles of interval training, like like slow jog and then like high pace. But I on the treadmill, I just like can't. I don't know what it is, but like you, when you have people that like kind of you have to like sort it out dif differently for different people when you're training them. Like how hard, how difficult is it to go from? like one client to another and they're trying to like their goal is the same like they want to increase their cardio or they want to increase their like leg strength or whatever but they have different sort of like preferences for how they do things how, is that difficult to like to sort of get to know them and then to figure that out it's um it's the art of uh training it's the art of coaching you have to read people and then you need to open your mouth and communicate with them too. Because if you don't, you're assuming and not all of the times you're assuming correctly. But if, if you don't check in with people from even from the start, like when when I meet a client, I'll ask them, well, you've have you have you exercised before? What aspects did you like and, and why that way I know, but I also want to teach them all that I know about another form of exercise. So again, if you like the track, great. I'm gonna make sure that I do a lot of track work with you, but maybe if you've never done circuit training in the gym, I can get you to incorporate a new form of high intensity or of cardio. Um, but maybe you didn't like it because you had a bad experience. Maybe you were at a um, big group class and you didn't get enough like attention and no one taught you how to do things right. So you felt that you weren't doing it right and you felt insecure. And so you don't like that. Um, I know that that's true for a lot of my clients is they don't like things they don't feel good at doing. So if you spend the time teaching them, now they have a newfound appreciation for it. They wanna get better at it because lifting, exercising is a skill. It can be taught, it can be learned. You just have to have the right teacher and the right amount of attention for each each person. So yeah, it's different with every person coming in, but people are also open to things too. You just have yeah. to find what they like, kind of start with that for sure, and then build their portfolio and try new things. And that's what keeps people engaged. You know, now we we train a lot of our adults like athletes, even if they haven't played sports, because being athletic means you can move well. Mm -hmm. So we can do that with basketball. We can do that with, you know, agility ladders. A lot of people should be doing plyometrics, but they don't know that, but it's great for bone growth, right? Mm -hmm. It's great um, for bone density. So uh, again, you, you kind of want to start with what you know for people and then expand, expand their horizon.
Yeah, I know, especially for some of the compound lifts, like deadlifts and squats, that, that makes people nervous because they don't want to hurt their backs. Seeing too many videos of like the bar being too heavy and like falling on people or like, yeah, stuff like yeah. that. And that's, that's education. So mm -hmm. the more you educate people and you know, that, that goes for the trainer themselves. Cause if, if you don't know how to talk the talk, you shouldn't be teaching those mm -hmm. lifts especially under that load. And so that's one reason why all of our trainers that we hire have to be working out. Um, and I'll, when I interview people, I ask them what their workout routine is like, what they know well, what they want to know, because mm -hmm. if they're not interested in learning and mastering things, I know they can't teach it. And yeah. that's, you know, sort of the, um, that's kind of what we stress when, when we teach is like, I know how to teach you this because I've learned it myself. So I know what muscles that you're using right now. I can see it in your posture that you're not squeezing your shoulder blades back as far because I used to do that. Mm -hmm. And now I can just, you know, almost touch and have you squeeze your shoulder blades back here. And now you're doing it right in order to protect your back in a deadlift. I need your back to be neutral and never rounded. Mm -hmm. And when you start to teach people these things, then they start to respect the lift a little bit more mm -hmm. and they want to learn more about the lift. And all of a sudden they're really excited about the lift because now they can pick up their 48 pack of Deer Park from the ground and into their car. And it's not a problem. Whereas before it might've been. Yeah, that's a good point as well. I know for me, it took me a while to learn to do deadlifts because I was nervous about like hurting my back. Um, and then once I picked it up, I do it. I do them often now because um, it's it's a really good lift for like your whole lower body um, and like just all around, just like explosiveness and strength. So it's good. Uh, I remember, have you always been sort of like uh, natural? Yeah, natural at like teaching. Because I like when we were coaching together, um, you seemed like very comfortable with telling them, hey, you have to plant off this foot if you're doing this movement, or you have to make sure your body weight is shifted this way and that sort of thing. Does that, did that come from years of like training or, or was that always sort of a natural skill for you? I would say it came from years of uh, practicing and, and years of experience more than anything else. And I also think some people are better at explaining and I don't know if I have experience that says oh I went through this so now I know how to talk about it um, but certainly years of playing sports uh, maybe even having leadership roles such as a captain running camps you have to explain things to kids being a trainer I explain every single day how to do mm -hmm. something and you only get I mean you should be getting better at it and part of the, the training that you do is to almost teach people as if they can't see. Um, and, and that's what I do when we get interns in. I'll have them not demo something for me. It's like, I want you to use your words without touching any of the weights. And mm -hmm. so you have to get really good and very familiar with the exercise that you're, that you're trying to explain in order to be able to reach all levels. And then it's just learning what works best with people. And a lot of clients get overly stimulated with all these fancy words. So get rid of those and just be efficient with your, your speech. Say, if you want them to, again, retract your shoulder blades, squeeze your blades, make it meet my hand and like give them a task to do. Uh, if you want them to run to a cone, plant your left foot on the, the outside of the cone, you know, and, and not be so complicated. Sit with your weight back into your hips, push off with your toes, and then we're going to explode. Yeah, I forgot what you said, you know, and <laughs> as you know, athletes are very simple minded people. Tell me where to run to. I will run and I will run as fast as I possibly can. Just tell me where, please mm -hmm. tell me where. You say, run straight 10 yards. Got it, coach. You say, explosively bring your knees up, plant into the ground. Wait, what? 
Yeah. No, so keep it simple and uh, you'll have a lot more success. The simpler you keep it, the more task driven your cues are. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you kind of learn at different courses or practicing with, with clients and kids. They'll tell you and you'll see it in their performance if they have trouble understanding it. Yeah, I have definitely have I've had people tell me what you do with the interns say explain without like dem demonstrating or without touching the equipment. I've had yeah. people do that with me before and I've never realized, like you don't realize until somebody's like, all right, explain without doing it. How difficult some of those things actually are to explain. But not even because they're complicated, it's because you never thought about it before. You never thought about explaining it without showing. Um, and there's been times like there were coaches like Thierry Henry when he was coaching at Monaco he like couldn't understand why his players like couldn't do all the stuff that he could do. So when he would try and coach, he would just be like, Oh, just do this. And he would do some like incredible thing. And they're like, coach, we can't do that. It's like, you're, you're one of the best in the world ever. We're just like, not. <laughs> and that, I mean, it's kind of, uh, when you think about it, it's, it's a very athlete thing also to not be great at explaining. Cause when mm -hmm. you're great, you feel the game, you feel the ball, you feel the lifts um that's that's part of what makes you really good you have this you know spidey sense of how things are supposed to be mm -hmm. but now when you teach it's very different you have to be able to communicate a clear message and that does take practice and maybe for some people almost undoing what you became really good at was just okay i can feel where the bar is supposed to go i can feel um how my body's supposed to be when i cross over well, can you explain it to somebody so somebody else can feel it? It's yeah. it's a totally different game. Yeah, I I think one of the things like when I was coaching, so I was coaching a high school team down in Fredericksburg, um, and I think one of the things that like I didn't have to skip the like undo because I never so I I played like half a season with with the team at UMW, but then after that I was always playing with sort of like players that were like slightly lower caliber than what I was used to and so I was used to having ex to explain where like where they should be or where they should go instead of just assuming that they would know so when I got to coaching I was already used to explaining it and then like in my head like I like if I was on the field I knew where to be but I was I picked up right. the ability to like explain hey when the, like where they should be and why because if you don't explain why especially like to a team was from high schoolers, especially if you don't explain why they're like, oh, whatever. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually about getting athletes to, you're trying to empower them to make their own decisions, not just this time, but the next time they get faced with the same situation. It's the same in, in personal training. If I don't educate and give you the full story, you're not as invested in your own program. Mm -hmm. It happens all the time when we get people that are novice exercise exercisers. Again, maybe they just run to stay fit. But now when they come in for an eval, I teach them so much more about their body. They came in to lose weight and make running easier or not hurt their knees. But I'm like, hey, just so you know, you need to be strengthening this if you don't want to hurt your knees. It's not how... Um, many miles you're putting in, yeah, that, that plays a role in it too, but you haven't done any lateral work. You haven't done any work to your core and your hips. And now they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And again, runners is just an example, but it, they're a group of people that choose to do a sport that seems not as dangerous. Mm -hmm. But if you do anything mindlessly and you don't have a full plan, you're, you're probably going to get hurt because you're not doing everything that you're supposed to do. And you could be doing something wrong. Nothing should be mindless in physical activity for a long period of time or, um, you know, frequently. 100%. That was, again, me in college. Like, I was just playing soccer without doing any of the strengthening of like the stabilizer muscles. And now I have tendinitis in both knees. And so I'm still dealing with with that, as you know, I've been into the studio many times for different exercises and different things, but I'm still dealing with the repercussions of just playing and not doing the proper work to like prepare myself to be able to play beforehand. Um, 
And it's, it's, it's so much more important than like anyone realizes until they get told that. Cause like, you know, that's not something intuitively that you kind of just know you have to, that's something that you have to be like, like, Oh, I'm running. So therefore I'm in shape. It's like, well, yeah. maybe, but also maybe not because of all these other things you might be hurting yourself in such and such way. Do you ever worry like when you have someone in for like someone's coming in, like one of your clients, do you ever worry that they'll like pick up some exercises and be like, okay, I've learned, I've learned enough. And then they don't like feel the need to come back. Or is that sort of, is that a goal or is that more of a worry for you? Like you want them to be coming back? No, I'm not worried about that. We haven't had a history of it because of the way we train, mm -hmm. which is to get people to do it for the long haul. Um, and again, unless you're in the same field as me, you shouldn't know as much as I do. <laughs> um, I'm trying to constantly learn. So it wouldn't make sense to me if, if a person left me after 10 sessions because I fixed them and now they've mastered it because I'm, I'm not trying to train you just for the short term. I'm trying to train you to also be independent as you get older. Um, I'm trying to prevent injuries when I'm with you. So I want to teach as much as possible, but I'm always learning. So that means that there's stuff that you should always be getting from me. And again, if, if you have a full-time job, you're taking care of your family, you're cooking, you have other interests, you probably aren't pouring into the, the health and the fitness and the nutrition information out there like I am. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to tell people when they come in, the value isn't just in the session itself. You know, like the $70, the $80 an hour session is not just for me to teach you how to bench press. But what I teach you is how to protect your shoulders from getting frozen shoulder, um, sitting up straight, um, protecting your lower back, being able to get down and off the ground that you get with the $70 an hour too. You can ask me any questions about the foods that you eat. So I'm a resource. And if I can, again, communicate that or get you to understand that, um, we have clients for the long haul and very rarely do we have them for, again, a package of three or a package of five. Mm -hmm. They're more than welcome to come in and with that being in their, in their intentions, but it rarely ever is. Was that a conscious choice that you and Pablo made when you first started the business that you wanted to keep like a, I don't want to say smaller group of clients, but like a more intimate, like long-term like how you was that how you guys envisioned building long the business term, yeah long-term definitely and that was from him again he had more training experience he'd worked at a couple of gyms by the time you know I had worked at one and then had done boot camp and one-on-one -on -one training but um it's it's a way financially to also keep cash flow which every business needs and yeah. when you sell packages in fives or tens it's not guaranteed and if people are coming in two times a week they're done in a month a month mm -hmm. and a half or they're done again you know like in a month so you know for a couple of reasons again at the same time i can't change your habits in five sessions i all i can do is inspire you that that's about it but i can't get you to change because you know there's all these um uh, facts out there that say it takes 30 days or it takes 90 days or whatever. Well, it can't happen in five sessions and that's for sure. So I need people for longer. If my goal is to change their life, I can change you and your body composition in, in 10 sessions. Yes, but I can't really impact your life in 10. So I need longer for that. Gotcha. So when you and Pablo were talking in the, at those 5 a.m. shifts at the gym you guys were working at, was that sort of like when you guys were first, uh, was it kind of a joint idea or was it like, how did that, how did the idea sort of form? And then how did this like vision of how you're going to keep your clients or like what sort of business you wanted to run? How did that sort of come about? Well, I have to correct you. First, we were talking mostly about breakfast. 
and what was coming um, at about 7 or 8 a.m. But no, uh, we did not talk about running a business until uh, we got evicted. <laughs> so it totally came out of accident or a little bit of surprise. Our gym was going through some troubles and uh, basically it ended pretty abruptly. We, we knew there were some troubles ahead of time because we had a close relationship with the owners. But uh, then all of a sudden we had a month left and we had to figure out what we were going to do. So Pablo mentioned he didn't want to work for anybody else anymore. He had come from a big, they call them big box gyms, but the gyms with all the equipment and you pay, you know, a $30 membership fee or whatever. He had come from that. And the way trainers are treated there is you hire the people that just get their certification or they're just out of college and you pay them really little and it's all about sales. So how much can you sell is how much value you have as a trainer where that's not the case. Um, that just means you're good at selling, right? Um, and that's how the, those gyms make money. Pablo had just come from that. So he didn't wanna go back to that. The gym we were at was a community gym. It was very small, intimate, you got respected more, but the gym still has to make their money. So the commission rate, which is how most trainers work, is again, whatever you sell, you get to bring in a portion of that. That wasn't as high as what it could be to make a living. And at this point, he had two young girls. They were just born, maybe a year or two years old. And he needed to bring in money for sure. I, I don't know what I was doing. You know, I was along for the ride. So <laughs> he was like, uh, do you want to start something? And I don't know what, what that conversation was really like. I don't remember, but I just said, yes. I was like, you work at 5 a.m. You seem to be smart and hardworking. What could possibly go wrong? I'm a good person. I'll try hard. Mm -hmm. And after that, there was no hesitation whatsoever. And I do not think twice about it in, in terms of, um, I, I didn't think twice about starting it. I certainly have more thoughts later as pressure gets harder and that we're, we're doing it, but um, every business owner does. That's not to say the, the partnership or the gym isn't a great idea or working well. That's just, that's just being real. But yeah, we, we just sort of said, hey, what are you doing for the rest of your life? Oh, you want to start a business? Fine, cool. What do you want to call it? And um, at lunch one day, we came up with a name. He came up with the, the colors. And somebody that wasn't even our client drew a logo while on the elliptical. And that's fitting. And that's how we started. That's awesome. Yeah, I feel like lots of even just like for the name for us, we were, Don and I were just hanging out one day, trying to come up with names. And we like had maybe five or six or seven different ones. And then we would Google it and we'd be like, oh, that, that one already exists. <laughs> like Google the next What's one. What's the XP? Experience. So it's like world experiences kind of. Um, we were like, the word experience is too long. Like, mm, what about XP? Like, oh, that works. And then had another friend draw the logo and then it's kind of what it was. So uh, it's wild. Those, yeah. um, those first couple like months or like that first year for those who are unaware of the hours put into making, starting a fledgling business and having it be successful. You want to go through sort of like the work that it took to get this thing off the ground and then like build your clientele and all that stuff? Yeah. So one, I like that you use the word fledgling. I took ornithology. Um, so uh, big props on using a bird term. And number two, to answer your actual question, um, starting a business is wild. Pablo nor I have taken business classes at all. And all of a sudden, it's 
you got to figure everything out, go. And so thinking of the name and the colors and all that was easy. And then now you're faced with, wait, everything depends on its legality. <laughs> so I have to look and see if the name's covered, what licenses do we need and uh, insurances, what can and can we not do, finding a place, all of that stuff. No one, there's not a straight path to do it. And I think that's wild. Like I wanted to go to Google and type in, how do you start a business? And you can, and Google will give you answers that you can, you can use, but you don't know a lot of what you're doing. And that's the honest truth. You just have to find out. So using resources like the internet or um, people and connections is, is huge. But in terms of time spent, I would say it's actually a lot more time now than what we spent to start it. We, and this is something that you don't know until you're in a business. When we started, yeah, there was time spent but we didn't have the clients, we didn't have the overheads, we didn't have the staff to make it as time consuming as what it is now. So when we started, we were in a 900 square foot office, to be quite honest. Um, and it was just me and him. So, you know, I had to kind of just do my part in getting my clients and he got his and trained his and then we each have our job of I'll do bookkeeping, you bring in more business, everybody sort of stays in their lane, but we don't have to oversee much. Mm -hmm. Now, flash forward to four years later, five years later, we have a new gym and we have staff and that staff keeps growing. Some of them are in the studio, some of them are not. It takes a lot more time now to train your people to bring in new business, to satisfy the people that you have, um, to keep the trainers, again, engaged intellectually, mm -hmm. to keep them interested, to keep them uh, happy to hear about them and what's going on in their, in their lives. I mean, that actually takes a ton of time and I'm not great at it. So sorry, staff, I know that that's <laughs> not my strong suit, but Pablo is really good at that. And that's uh, a blessing. Uh, it takes a lot more time as you go and you just get a different set of problems every year. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't get easier, it changes and you have moments and, and months even of times that are easy and times that are really, really hard. Um, and that just is this uh, cycle, um, you know, a, a roller coaster, if you will, this un undulating like waves of, oh, it's really cool. I get to take more time off. Um, oh, no, I have to work from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. every single night. It just, it's just part of running the business. And there seem to be seasons where you're in the business more. And there are some seasons where you get to be out of it more. How difficult was was it for you guys to find the like trainers and staff that you have now that fit the mold? Because they all like all of the all of the ones who work there now fit sort of like it fits really really nicely together. Like when you go in, like you get the same vibe or a similar vibe from any, from pretty much everybody except for Belly because she's Belly, nice. but <laughs> except for Belly, yeah. yeah. But like, no, it's, it's um, difficult to find, to get like a good fit. And then if you are really searching for someone like that has a specific skill set, then you need to find someone with that skill set that also fits personality wise. Um, how, how difficult is, and then also if you don't need that person, but you found somebody that, that could fit, but you don't really have a need for them is there a consideration of like, hey, maybe we hire them on anyways? Or like, how does that all work for you guys? Yeah, it is about timing and fit. It is kind of like an actor fitting a play. You can still act, but you might not fit for that play. Um, and you may even hire on very weird or untraditional characteristics of the person. 
Mm -hmm. Um, We've had people that are overqualified and we didn't hire them. And that happened in the very beginning. And it may be surprising because you're like, whoa, don't you want the best staff that knows, you know, the, the most about training? And the answer is yes. But if that staff member doesn't want to grow at the level that you're growing, it's not going to work out well for them or for you. So that should be considered when, when you're hiring. Mm -hmm. um, and now that we've been doing it for a bit, you can kind of see what you need um, and what works for the what works for the person. You know, it's it was very different when you first start. You're like, oh God, I need help. And almost like I need it now. You know, I need three or four people um, ready to go. So your process is a little different and maybe you're a little more flexible with your terms. But now that you have a system and you have people in place, it's, it's an option to grow um, and you wanna grow with the right, the right person. So again, that could be somebody that fills a void that you don't do, has a service that you don't offer, um, or maybe they add to a service that you already do in some way. Um, but we do a lot of LinkedIn and online stuff and actually LinkedIn has worked pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, referrals work really well too, though, um, for us and the way our gym, our gym's personality is. We are very community oriented. And like you said, there's a vibe when you go in. Mm -hmm. So our, you know, pitch, if you will, to trainers that are coming in is, hey, we're here because we're all trying to learn from each other. I want to make training a career for you and not just a job. I want to know like what you are excited about, what you come in with and where do you want to take it? And I'll be honest with you, if I can, like, if this is the gym that's going to help you get there mm -hmm. and then if it is great, let's be partners, not um, one-sided. Yeah. It makes sense. I remember um, taking Jenna into the gym for, I think she was working with you for her, uh, her knee and we left she was like everyone is just happy in there and I was like yeah it's like <laughs> that's what it is it's just like the vibe is good the music makes you feel it's it's not like other gyms where it's just like pop music from the radio it's like it's a very unique sort of sort of feel you mentioned um hiring people that maybe offer something that you don't offer currently so obviously you guys started off with just training, but now you've ventured into soccer and you're starting to venture into basketball. What is sort of the thought process with, with those two sort of uh, branches of, of the business or like, do you guys have, I don't want to say, are you guys winging it, but like, do you have a concrete, like. Absolutely winging it, Eric. Absolutely <laughs> winging it. Um, no, nothing is concrete. And if anybody tells you that we do something concrete, they are not informed. I was uh, trying to give you more credit than that. Thank but. you, Eric. But you are a witness to um, how we do things. And no, no, nothing is written prior to. And I operate that way. So I wish things were written down prior to. <laughs> but um, with Pablo, it's very special. Uh, it's not. And you know, it's, it's also something that people have to be flexible with. And that's a lesson that I've learned is, yes, I like things to be planned and written. But God, if it was just me in the business and that's how things were, PR would be done um, because they don't always work out that way. And with the example of COVID, as you know, we didn't really have a soccer program before. We had a couple players that came in and we did like some group classes, but truly it was a handful. Well, start of COVID, we hire a wonderful man named Omar, which I, I don't even know how he came, but um, I guess through Pablo somehow, but truly a godsend because we had lost a lot of personal training and all of our group classes were no longer happening. So the bulk of our revenue was gone. Omar came and he starts our soccer program or ramps it up to what it is now. And he truly did that on his own. We started training at the local park. 
we started um, having two teams, younger teams that he's coaching um, and, and his fellow coaches for the academy. And we didn't have a system in place. And that, oh my gosh, annoyed me because I'm the one that does like the back end stuff and I'm freaking out like, wait, but you didn't charge this person and we didn't take attendance and come on, like we need to get this stuff together. And you know, my lovely partner is like, Rachel, then help, help put that in place. And he was right, you know, I'm freaking out, but I also didn't put a solution in. And guess what? When you put the plan in place, now you have the money coming in that wasn't, and now you have something so beautiful that didn't exist beforehand. And now I can definitely say that is something that I really, really love to do. Whereas before I was, you know, very fearful of it because it was change. Same with online training. I was scared. I was intimidated. But now that I have tried it, I really enjoy it. And I get to connect with people and do it in a way that is, number one, safe right now. But two, it actually provides a lot more opportunities. And that's, again, for each each party. So, um yeah, it's been, it's been fun. There's nothing written in stone and nothing written ahead of time. It's whenever you see where the players are on the field, you make a call and that's what we do. Yeah. I remember when he, when, when he first came and started running the trainings, um, everybody, like all the players that I knew that were going were kind of just like, well, this is good. So we have a structured place to train so we'll stay in shape during lockdown get touches on the ball there's like good quality um and I think everyone at first was just kind of like well this is really nice and then it blossomed into the Mexico trip and having different teams and different opportunities for different people um but it's really cool that you guys are doing that you guys have put a ton of time into that um which is awesome. And then it branched also into you guys are doing sort of strength and conditioning for a local, a local club as well. Right. Yeah. We're again, who knows what's coming in the next month? I don't know, but um, what we found to be again, another safe way to do exercise was we did everything outside. So we partnered with uh, a premier AC and um, that's a local soccer club. And we've been doing strength and conditioning sessions for them on their, their field in uh, soccer, soccer. So we'll go to the field and we do like an hour, hour and a half session for them, teaching them biomechanics of the game, how, how to land safely, how to take off uh, when they're cutting, how to decelerate, all those fun things and applying the skills that they already know, but now teaching them how to do it efficiently and safely. Mm -hmm. uh, or in some cases, again, saying, hey, you need to supplement what you're doing with more strength in this area because you're landing like this and your knee keeps going inward, but it should be in line with, you know, your second and third toe or your ankle. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so th that's been, again, something that I was not expecting. We didn't train athletes for like five years. I mean, we'd get some one-on-one, -on -one, but we didn't have any program up mm -hmm. until, you know, the past year. So kind of surprising since both Pablo and I were athletes, but uh, I wouldn't change it. And it's been really energizing to see how much youth we have in the gym right now. Uh, it's totally different than what we were doing before. Is it a nice change of pace for you to have, like, maybe not have to explain everything from the ground up like you would a, another client and to be able to do sort of like more higher level, difficult, more difficult stuff with, with athletes? It's different. I say um, that's not always the case because athletes have this desire to be the best, to be the fastest, to be the strongest. So they often create compensations in their body or they ignore everything that you teach them or 
uh, everything that is, you know, correct and in, in form in order to get the job done, because that's what the athlete does run from here to 10 yards as fast as you can remember. So, uh, it's a different style of training and what, what I think is different is how you get them to understand why they're doing what they're doing, where an adult comes in I said, maybe they're a general exerciser or, um, you know, they, they're novice or they're doing it to just stay fit or to be healthy. They know why they're there at that point. Yeah. Sometimes with the younger athletes, their parents might bring them in. Uh, the player, maybe if they're older, again, wants to become faster, stronger, or just better at their sport. And so they don't understand why a lift should be done in the way that it's done and in the order that it's done and then how that directly translates to what they do on the field or on the court and it's and it's your job to show them and to structure the routine that day uh, to educate them about the periodization of your routine like all right this week these two weeks we're focused on this training and this is for this and then we switch it to be um, more muscular endurance. And so now your routine is like this. And now we're doing five levels of plyometrics. And then we're deloading because you're starting season, et cetera, et cetera. And when you get a player to buy into that and buy into the recovery process, it's really cool because you're just like opening their eyes to this new world because they haven't experience that or they haven't been exposed to someone that teaches them the x's and o's instead of just saying do this do that show up here yeah the recovery thing again is something like it doesn't get talked about enough like i didn't do hardly any recovery except for like throw a bag of frozen peas on my knee or like anything like that now being able to go in like have the massage done like the different techniques the scraping the cupping like all this different stuff that you guys do that has definitely helped me stay injury free and come back from injuries faster than probably I otherwise would have um but it's, that's another education point that I don't think gets talked about enough like with younger athletes but I'm not coaching that much well I'm coaching with you so obviously it gets talked about but I'm not sure it gets talked about enough in sort of the, um, the younger circles, but I want to touch on something. So you have sort of like high school and college athletes, and then you have some professional or on the bubble professional athletes. What is the difference in sort of the mindset between like a high school or like a, like a high school or that sort of age versus like the on the bubble slash professional athlete? Like when you work with them, what's sort of the different, not just in, the skill set itself, obviously, but in the mindset of how they work. Not always true, but I'd say the number one thing I've seen with the athletes that have come through our doors is that a semi-professional or professional athlete knows how to put in the work on their own to get the job done. A high school athlete does not know that yet. And that's just the nature of it. They haven't mm -hmm. been anywhere. I mean, they played high level, but they haven't made it to pro. So they don't know what to do. They'll do it. They just don't know what. And, and so they tend to overtrain doing things that aren't actually going to make them better than what they already are. So by that, I mean, again, in the example of uh, soccer, you might have some of the high school athletes spending time picking the ball and not working with other people on how to move the ball faster as a unit. They don't know how to make a first touch more efficient instead of making two touches or two steps into one, but they'll spend their time practicing stationary kicks in a goal or cone dribbles that they've already mastered. A high school athlete needs to think faster. They're already gonna be slower physically because their body hasn't matured, but the pace of the game is faster the higher level that you go. So you have to train your body how to think and make decisions better. And a pro, 
or a semi-pro, they have already experienced that. It's almost like, and I don't know video games, but it's almost like getting a PS5 already and you're so excited, but now you've played it. So it's not as exciting anymore. And they actually struggle with confidence and love of the game. So you have to teach with more acceptance of where they're at and almost just like be a support system because when you're at that level, it's your job to play well. So you're constantly criticized for not playing well constantly. And there's so many other pressures out there that you often see athletes turn to habits that aren't good for them, um, habits that um, distract them from playing at optimal levels, drinking, um, you know, they often get depressed, they're doing uh, marijuana, things like that. And, but it's, it's part of how the culture is and what an athlete goes through. And I think people don't understand that. They don't understand that pressure um, and what it's like because you're never good enough. Just very, very few times you're good but you're never good enough. There's always the next level. And so it's almost like the higher you get, the more you are, are difficult on yourself and you just constantly think negative. In high school, you're trying to make it. So there's all this hope going around. And when you're older, it's not as much about hope. It's like pulling yourself out of the gutter mm -hmm. over and over again. And I mean, I don't know if that answers the question about difference in mentality, but again, with the players that I've seen come through our door and what and Pablo has done a really good job of and what our staff tries to do is be more supportive and be a friend to, to, to the players and like hear them because so often they don't get to be heard because coaches don't care. It's not their job to care. It's their job to win games. No. Um, so people lose the fun side of it. They lose uh, the, the passion and um, they forget how to like dig deep because they're just beaten down all the time. Yeah. And their careers on the line oftentimes as well. That's added pressure. Yeah, that makes sense. I feel like, especially for so, like the guys who go professional when they're young, late teens, early twenties, it's hard to find yourself when you're in that environment of always needing to, you need to do better. You need to do this better. And it's hard to. Do you have young people taking your spot anyway? So again, mm -hmm. like when you're younger, there's all this hope because you're still trying to make it. You're trying mm -hmm. to move up. You're trying to take somebody's spot. When you're old, you not old, but uh, <laughs> when you're a veteran of the game, you're mm -hmm. trying to protect your spot. So instead of becoming aggressive, you become defensive. And anybody that's played sports knows when you're defensive and you're playing not to lose, you're not going to be playing well. Mm -hmm. And you play very much in your head and you start to overthink and you lose that sense of feel, which is really important for an athlete. Yeah. We'll hop off the depressing note now. <laughs> yeah. um, Sorry, are you considered old, Eric? Am I considered old? Yeah, where are you on that scale? Did I probably did I call you old? Probably with the athletes that we went to Mexico with, I'd be considered old. I mean, you acted old, so there's that. Yeah, well, you know, that happens. But I'm I'm ten years older than you, so I'm like really old. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, youth. Youth. Um, but so you're starting to try, or you're trying to start the basketball and this is, are you trying to start it in the similar sort of fashion as are you using the soccer as a blueprint or are you trying to be more organized than, <laughs> than, um, than the soccer was? In a perfect world, yes, it would be like that. But um, I don't, no one lives in a perfect world. And um, what I'm trying to do for basketball is teach a high level of, of mechanics uh, to, to players. That's my goal with it because when I played, it wasn't everybody has their own path, but it was very much about 
skill level and um, not necessarily how many points did you make, but what impact did you have on numbers and uh, like, were you efficient on the floor? Mm -hmm. And if you were, you got minutes and if you weren't, you didn't play. That's true, that's how sports are, but I didn't get a high level of training. I got high level practices for sure, but never did I receive the information that I believe to give to my athletes and to keep them healthy. I am a double ACL surgery um, athlete. So I tore mine once in high school and I tore the other one in college. And I was very strong uh, in, in terms of weightlifting. I did it, but I wasn't strong in all of the directions, which I know now. And actually I look at my body as very weak in order to play sports. I'm very good at pushing and bench pressing and squatting. And I was then, but that's not what I needed with all the lateral movement. My <laughs> hips, my glutes were not very strong. My core wasn't, I didn't understand why I needed it. And now as a fitness professional, I know that's why I got hurt. So what I want to do is kind of bring the same level of training and, and a lot to the ankles because basketball is known for having ankle sprains and it really shouldn't be that many. It is just as um, lateral as many other sports that don't have the high ankle injury rate, whatever, whatever that is. I know when I played, you like rolled one every other weekend and you're like, oh, let me put a McDavid brace on it. It'll be fine. And you yep. just kept going but never corrected the problem. Like that's all preventable. And yeah. now that I know that I want to get players to train that way because it affects how quickly they move um, and how well they land. And that's, that's kind of the problem and in, in why people get hurt is they're not landing properly and they're not pushing off. Right. Or they don't know enough about their body as they grow. Like in high school, if you get a growth spurt, they don't know how to control it. And so I want to bring that level. And then certainly, again, how do I get a player to be more efficient on the court? Yes, that too. Goal number one is education and body awareness and um, get people to learn how to use what they have um, or how to develop what they, what they need developed. I feel like one of the other reasons for the sprained ankle, at least in basketball, is I, I rolled mine a lot landing on other people's feet and yeah. that's but can't you do that in soccer well if you're going up for a rebound and there's like four people all going up at the same like the same within the same like within the restricted area or something it's a little so, bit different yes but if you learn how to land on your toes which basketball is not very People have tight calves in basketball, but it's not from having strong ankles. It's just from like repeating the same, like taking off and jumping movement. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, in comparison to soccer, you're running so much more on your toes. And again, maybe it's the level that I'm training at too mm -hmm. and seeing um, high level soccer players. But I know from my experience, I was never taught to do anything on my toes, like really except for a sprint straight. Yep. Never to land on them, never to push off on them. That's, I mean, you should be pushing yeah. off the ball of your foot. So if you're never taught that, um, you're going to roll. And again, in the case of landing on somebody's foot, if I land and then I, you know, kind of land unevenly, well, if I land straight off the, like my toes, then it doesn't really matter because my ankle's strong enough to stay upright. Uh, so I think there's a lot to be said about just conditioning, uh, especially with ankles. Yeah, ankles are a problem spot for sure. It's hard to, like with, with knees, I feel like it's a little bit simpler. Like in your head, you're like, oh, let me strengthen like my quad or whatever, or like my hamstring for like to stabilize it. But with ankles, it's like, there's not really a, like I've got like, Kevin is helping with some exercises, but even it's like it's not an intuitive like strengthening um, sort of like. Well, I think, to strengthen. 
I think people also look at injuries as a causation of the sport. Mm -hmm. Like, as soon as you say, oh, somebody plays basketball, you assume they rolled their ankle and tore their ACL. Mm -hmm. And like, because you played basketball, it makes sense. But again, most fitness professionals know that it's like maybe 60% of ACL tears are from non-contact, which yeah. means, yeah, they're preventable. Um, so you're landing wrong, uh, you're hyperextending, whatever whatever the case is. Um, Those are the worst ones to watch too. Yeah. Do you get sick when you look at those? Um, not really. I like. I feel like I watch it and I'm like, I don't want to run now. <laughs> what does that mean? Like, I, like, especially when my knees are hurt, like when my knees were really bad with the tendonitis, I would like watch it happen and just be like, nope, that's gonna be me tomorrow. I'm not running. Yeah, you can, you can feel it. Yeah, I think, I think people again, it it comes down to what you what you know and what you assume. So if you don't know that these things can be prevented or how to condition them so that you can make the movements you need to make. And yeah, there are injuries in sports that happen and you can't prevent them, but uh, at the, the lower levels, really at, at most levels, due to, due to training, whether you're recovering, you're sleeping, you're eating, again, just the knowledge of where to land um, and practicing it enough times at the speed that you need to practice it at um, or the force that you need to hit the ground with. That's what makes injuries go from a really high percentage to a lot lower. Yeah. It's a, it's, that's an education thing as well. It's like people don't realize like, oh, if I don't get enough sleep, like you feel tired, but it affects so much more than that. It's like your brain is not into like focusing on every movement and how it otherwise would and all sorts of different things. Um, what is, if you, if you were talking to like your younger self in terms of athletic career and like your ACLs and then life, like starting the business and stuff, what sort of advice would you give yourself now knowing what you know? Hmm. I think, I mean, it's easy to say I would change maybe some things, how, how I approached athletics, um, just injury prevention wise, but you know, information that's available to me now would not have been available to me then. So mm -hmm. it's kind of irrelevant in terms of how I would have maybe given advice, knowing what I know now, professionally or personally to myself, I guess I would just say, try to connect with people more and be open and honest and authentic more. And I didn't know that I wasn't then. And I actually notice more now that I tend to shy away from those opportunities because I'm protecting myself or protecting somebody else, or they don't need to know mm -hmm. about this. Uh, it's not a good time. Um, and I think at each each stage of, of your life, you realize a little bit more about yourself and what basketball was for me was an outlet that I did not know until now because I was playing something every day and I was very focused on what I was doing and school like put me in focus. So for eight hours a day, I'm going to school for three hours a day. I'm playing basketball, definitely three hours of eating. So 100% <laughs> focused on, on that. So I don't really have much time left in the day. Um, you know, maybe two hours of homework. I got like two hours left, mm -hmm. but now it's a lot easier to be in your head when you're, when you're working, or if you choose to not put your all into something in front of you, your thoughts can can wander and all of a sudden you're not present 
and what sports did for me was put me, make me present. And um, it also made me connect with people because I was around people in, in a special way and you listen to them more. And now as you're an adult and you're, you're working, you kind of have to make yourself do it. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know that my younger self would get as much advice from my older self as my older self might get some advice from my younger self. <laughs> <laughs> that's true yeah every, like the outlet thing is super interesting like, you, like for me I always kind of knew that soccer was the outlet but didn't realize until COVID happened I was like I was talking to Jenna a couple of weeks ago I was like without soccer I would have gone insane by now just like like the yeah. outlet for for like physical activity one seeing people too but also like getting like good the competitive edge that that you need out it's yeah. like Sure. I would have gone, I don't even know, no. but um, so I'm very grateful that you guys found Omar. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. Yay, Omar. No, and um, for those of you who don't know, and Eric, this is news to you, I'm signing PR up for a co-ed soccer league now. So um, back on the soccer field, boom, 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 <laughs> and hopefully... <laughs> Hopefully, well, I'll tell you how the experience went last time. Not that you asked, but I'll just tell you anyway. Well, um, I played against you. Oh, wait, which league was that? Oh, was that the, the one up in Arlington? Oh, okay, yeah. I don't remember you. Probably because, you know, I was so fast and, like, I didn't see you. <laughs> like, you were always behind me or something. I, but, I don't think we, we hadn't met yet at that point. I had only known Pablo for, like, a month. Yeah, so that experience was kind of pleasant. The one, pleasant because we won and it was competitive, but we always struggled like getting people there mm -hmm. all the time. So that makes it not as fun. The first team like we, we played on was an, a co-ed team and it was really fun except Are you there? Oh, is it unfrozen now? Yep, you're good. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was saying that in the first first time we played, we had fun, and then we also got into a fight after every single game. And some of those times was with the other team. Uh, most of it was with <laughs> us. Oh, <good>. uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, it was it because it was competitive and then the juices start flowing. So mm -hmm. I, I miss that. And that's all I did in soccer because I didn't know how to touch the ball or pass it. Like I would just run and then hopefully run into somebody at some point and then run back. And that's how I knew I was doing this for exercise. For the first time in my life, I had to do cardio built into my sports and in a sport that I didn't know how to do. And it was a total stress relief and I loved it. And so we're bringing it back, even though we've had some traumas that we've had to overcome. <laughs> the last season, I scored one goal. It was on our own team. <laughs> and it was so bad because we were already getting our butts kicked, which was what happened all season. And I don't know if you've ever made a mistake and your team is so mad, they don't react. <laughs> it was like I don't know if I've ever made one that bad. I've made plenty of mistakes, but. Well, you should come to some games. <laughs> I will. I will you have should cover to. them. Can World mm -hmm. XP do like sports casting too? Oh. Uh... It's a new experience. That's, that's true, it would be. I don't know, we'll see. It might be on the horizon for us, you never know. I you think your know. commentary is great. I always look for it on the sidelines of um, the WPL games or any game, really. I'm like, but what does Eric say? That's, yeah. Well, sometimes I go into coach mode, but. It's fine. Ramon loves me. Shouts out to Ramon. Um, 
Speaking of on the horizon, what is on the horizon for you guys, for the business and for you personally? Mm. Remember the like, no plan ahead thing. Mm -hmm. So that's still in effect as oh, nice. of you know, the, like 20 minutes ago that we covered it. But uh, if I were to guess, because you did ask a question, um, I would say more with with soccer for sure. We're just like pouring into that. And I don't know what's gonna come out of that, but there's gonna be a lot. And I, I think 2021, we're gonna see big developments in, in that arena, whether that's in our academy with our younger kids, sending more players to play professional, uh you know you'll have to stay tuned and invite me back and <laughs> later in the year um personally i just hope more more growth in using this time period and um new decade of my life because now again i'm i'm 30 to be again more more open and less in in the headspace of i gotta do this it's gotta be this way and just kind of let life do what life does mm -hmm. and and talk to people like this this was something that i've wanted to do and i talked about it with debbie uh, our yoga instructor and we we talked about doing a podcast so um she's going to be really excited that i i did this because it's just something that I don't think people people get afraid to do these things. So I commend you for for doing it because it's really cool to hear your voice and for you to have different takes and experiences and questions on on things that I I don't answer all the time. You know, I don't really get to talk to clients um, outside of the sessions as much as. Uh, as much as you know, maybe people might think some days we do, but you don't always get into this stuff. So to be able to share it is kind of fun for me. And you you get this sort of feeling of reflection and again, yeah, actually like self-satisfaction because you're like, oh yeah, I forgot about those times when it was just me and him and we had three clients uh, and now look at where we are and you know, our problems are, oh my gosh, are we growing too fast? Wow, it's terrible. Um, so personally, just, just growth. I, I actually have zero expectations. I lower the bar like so low now. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just my way of coping, but I also think it's it's good for me and maybe some people are so used to having the bar set so high. You need to get this for your grades. You have to get again this amount of sales. Like I no, don't don't sign me up for any expectations at all. People know I, I don't like even committing to dinners like in a week. It's like what? Yeah, we're committing to scheduling this podcast. Stop. Stop. <laughs> that was a special incident, people. He's poking fun I that am. I missed our first meeting. I am. I am poking fun. No, in all seriousness, though, I like one of the things that I told Dylan when we first started was he was like, what, like, we were talking about, do we have expectations for this? And I was like, you know, I was like, if one person gets something helpful out of an episode, then for me, I'm happy. Like, I don't need to have a million listeners or whatever, because then people are mean in the comments and no, <laughs> no, but, but joking aside, like to have people like yourself on, like Pablo on, like some of the other guests on that we've had for just different discussions on different topics. Like if one person gets something helpful out of this, like this one, like, oh, maybe I should sleep more. Maybe I should like train, like look up training this, like strengthening my ankles then that for me is like satisfying. I hear so, some people will reach out and be like, hey, I really like this episode because of this one part. Um, and that's what it, that's what it's for. So yeah. the self-reflection definitely for me is on the episodes itself. It's like, could I have asked a different question here? Could I have asked a different question there? Or sort of steered the conversation this way. But for the guests, it's kind of like, 
you have something to share with people and that sometimes you don't get the opportunity to do like to share and I think that people would find what you have to say helpful and so here you are and we'll hope, hopefully people will, people will find what you had to say helpful. Um, yeah and in the spirit of inspiring one person that person can also be the person that you're talking to right so mm -hmm. um again this is this is big for me and as like a personal yeah i'm the one that got myself onto the show <laughs> i was like eric put me on uh because i wanted to do it and you know it's it, it didn't take much but it's something that a wall that we put up in front of ourselves of why this podcast can exist well i don't have time i don't have the microphone or whatever you might have went through but then you kind of put that to the side and you just did it and life is so much better when you just do it and not think about all the reasons it can't work or it won't work well and um that's that's a testament to you so good job on pushing through and i'm sure your guests feel the same way uh, about being on and what whatever it is that they specialize in it was like just do it yeah just get out there. put yourself just, out there just start your own podcast with debbie i know the yoga people would like it but challenge accepted there you go on that note it's been almost an hour and a half it's getting late so i will let you go where can we find you guys on social media the internet Plug all, plug away. I prefer pony mail or whatever it's called. No, um, you, we're on Instagram and we have like a couple different accounts, but PR Performance Fitness, PR Performance Soccer. Uh, you can find me at It's a Wrap Thing. Don't ask me what that means. Just message me and we'll be, you know, buns. Um, and then we're certainly on Facebook. Just search the same name that you see here right on the screen you and missed, you missed it but close enough there you go uh, other corner thing. oh well uh, i'm not going to do that again but <laughs> <laughs> um and then yeah email pr performance fitness at gmail.com all the good stuff you'll see us sounds but good not, no. we got to increase our google presence yeah all those links will be in the in the description guys rachel it was a pleasure to have you on um and yeah i mean you already invited yourself back so i'm sure we'll see you back on at some point Thanks, sounds good bye everybody